talk, but this is Mazarin Banaji. Thank you, Roger. Roger was careful to say I was born into a Zoroastrian family. I stopped believing roughly around the age of eight, and um, by 12 had written my personal essay. That hasn't changed much in the last several decades. Um, and so in many ways, even though this religion is a very interesting one and tells a very interesting story, um, and it, is, it was the world's first monotheistic religion, um, uh, Zoroastrians had, were largely converted by Islamic invasions of Persia, and a uh, small number escaped to India where they got religious freedom and have largely lived in India for the last several um, centuries, since the ninth century, still managing to see themselves a distinct group because in India, if you're only 11 centuries old, you're a newcomer. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me if the group died in my own lifetime. Um, so one less religion to deal with. Um, um, I have been looking at these surveys that, that have been written about, Richard Dawkins writes about in his book, the one that compares National Academy members to uh, you know, less illustrious uh, academics to the general population and so on. And, and there's one that I actually remember seeing from some years ago when the numbers of believers in the, in the, in the general population was even higher. Um, and also looked at a breakdown amongst people who are members of institutions of higher learning. I remember being somewhat surprised at the large number of believers in both the humanities and in the physical sciences. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, so the humanists, when you read a beautiful poem or listen to great music, you fall to your knees and you believe. Uh, if you're a physical scientist, you look at the cosmos and you fall to your knees and you belie believe. But those of us who are social scientists who deal with human beings, uh, when you do that, there is very little reason to see God. And, and so the story, I'm going to tell you the story of what much of the social sciences have uh, shown us in the last few decades, mainly story after story about human error. Um, so I'm going to begin by uh, just telling you that my own intellectual traditions come from sort of two places. Um, first of all, I'm quite interested in a concept called unconscious inference that was first written about by Hermann von Helmholtz uh, 150 years ago or so, um, in which he argued and showed that um, much of the way in which we perceive, this is Rama's work, by the way, I should say that the two people whose work mine is most connected to in terms of uh, lineage would be Rama's talk that you heard yesterday and then Beth Loftus' um, comments that you heard earlier today. And so I'm very much interested in this notion of how it is that we go about doing much of what we do uh, without knowing. Uh, and by not knowing, I'm going to be referring to concepts of things that happen outside conscious awareness. So the source of influence exists somewhere away from the location. This is action at a distance. And I'm going to be talking about all of this uh, as mental phenomena, of course. And then the second tradition in which I roughly sit is research on what, what is these days called judgment and decision making, work that uh, has influenced the field of economics dramatically in reshaping the 19th century view of humans as rational into the one that we now uh, hold these days um, that human beings are boundedly rational. And interestingly, of course, both, both Nobel Prizes that um, economics has given to psychologists have been for the same kind of work for showing that human behavior is less rational than economists might believe. Um, so the, uh, there, there are lots of demonstrations of this. One of them is to simply ask people, you know, what do you think is the, um, is the bigger cause of deaths each year in the United States? Do more people die from diabetes each year or being in a homicide, from being in tornadoes or struck by lightning and so on? So what would you say? Of these two, how many of you think that more people die each year because of diabetes rather than homicide? Okay. Uh, how many of you think more people die each year because they're struck by lightning than because they're in a tornado? Okay. And... How many of you think that more people die from abdominal cancer each year than car accidents? Okay. So the right answer is diabetes. The right answer is lightning. 
and the right answer is abdominal cancer. Okay? And you know, that, you know that one because we've learned these days, in the last 10 years, we've been taught over and over again that we overestimate the incidence of homicide and that we shouldn't, that more people die in car accidents, and, that, and so we know that one. But these two we don't, but the error comes from a very simple source. The source is, 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 is this. The ease with which information comes to mind is mistakenly taken as evidence of its frequency. Okay? So what we do is we just look to see how much we're going to uh, feel how easy something was to come to mind and then mistakenly use it uh, to account for frequency. There's a very cute variation on the study where you ask half the subjects in the study to generate three reasons why they love their partner or nine reasons why they love their partner. Okay? The intuitive assumption would be that if you generate nine reasons why you love your partner, you're going to love your partner even more than the three. The uh, result is exactly the opposite. Um, people who write three reasons for loving their partners end up saying that they love them more than those who generated nine reasons. And the assumption here, based on Danny Kahneman's notion of uh, ava the availability heuristic, is that you know, who has nine amazing properties? So by the time you get to number five, you're struggling. Six is hard. Seven is almost impossible. And you make eight and nine up. And when you've had that difficulty in generating it, you use that to make a misattribution about the quality of your relationship. Okay? So, so these are the kinds of bugs in our minds that we're interested in. Um, this is one that experts fall prey to as well. Uh, ask people to write down the last four digits of their social security number, and then ask them to estimate the number of doctors in New York City. Collect those two numbers, do a simple correlation, should be zero. It's actually around 0.4. Okay? The point is that when you write something down, like a social security number, it is very hard for you not to anchor your thinking from wherever that number sits. And so that no matter how hard you're trying to sort of think about rationally what that number might be of num doctors in New York City, that number is going to have influence in some causal way. Because again, reasonably, we've learned that when two things sit next to each other, there might be a relationship. And that, that rule is being misused in this case. Okay. Um, there are lots of interesting studies these days looking at how tiny a piece of influence can make us end up becoming people that we may or may not be. Okay? This is an older study that appeared very recently in psychological science. Uh, you bring people into the laboratory, have them sit in room A or room B, you watch them eat, and then you measure how cleanly they ate, okay? who put their plates away, how much food was dropped, etc. And the only difference between the two rooms is that in one room, you've sprayed Lysol before people came in, and in the other, it's just a normal room. People in the room where that smelling of Lysol eat more neatly, clean up after themselves, okay? and, and leave the room in a clean sort of way, uh, but being quite unaware that this odor cue is what made them uh, do this. So Rama showed us examples of patients with various kinds of damage, you know, making up stories confabulating. By the way, in a study like this, I've always been intrigued that, that over time, if you are in a household that has been sprayed with Lysol a lot, you end up being a clean person for that reason. But very quickly, we come to assume that that's an internal state, that that's a property of the person, that there are people like us who are clean and them who are dirty and so on. Okay, so that's, um, and then, of course, um, Pat Churchland showed you one illusion. Uh, but until you show, until you show, nobody believes. <laughs> and so, uh, so you know this one. Those of you who are psychologists know this one uh, very well. It's a famous one by Roger Shepard. Um, on perspective, these two table surfaces are exactly the same in shape and size. Uh, they will not appear that way to you at all. So I'll do a quick demonstration, in part because I want to make the point that illusions like these, while telling us a lot about how the mind is set up and wired and works, uh, is also maybe important uh, in us thinking about strategies for teaching. Okay? So I've used this device, in part, to shake people's beliefs in what they think is true, because these so truly don't look to be the same. So I'm just going to turn this off. You're going to bear with me for a second while I put up a transparency with the same pictures. There we go. And here you go. Ready? There we go. For the skeptics, one more time. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
no magic at all. Your retina sees accurately, but when the information goes up to the 50th floor, it gets interpreted, comes back uh, again. Yeah, exactly. Ah, is that, who said that, Paul? No, Neil, Neil. Okay, all right, so Neil has homework to do then. Hold on, let's see. <laughs> and in fact, Neil's comment yesterday in his talk that it's when we can't explain things that we uh, have to look for examples. Uh, you can pass it around, yeah. Um, and you can stay back after class, yeah. All right. <laughs> what did you say, Rama? All right. Pardon me? Yeah, I agree. I use it because it is it, it just blows your so so anyway, you know, Rama can tell you a lot more about how this illusion works, but it is it is basically uh, the legs are doing some of the work. The idea is that in a 3D world we would be fine, but when you move worlds from 3D to 2D, you're doing something very simple. You're assuming that information that's parallel to the line of vision has to be lengthened. What's perpendicular to the line of vision must be shortened. So when you cut the legs off, you will lose some of the illusion, but not entirely, actually. All right, so um, anyway, the, po the two points that I want to make, that those of you who are in the physical sciences know the importance of devices, okay? Uh, at least Bertolt Brecht's Galileo says, I'm going to shove their face in front of it and they're going to have to believe. And he was right in the sense that, yes, having an instrument makes an enormous difference, uh, but not entirely, right? It took the Vatican a good 350 years to, to, to agree. And so, so, so what I'm going to argue is that having tools for the mind sciences to show that there are these bugs in our minds that make us do and feel and think things that are not true, we're going to, the onus is on us to design and develop techniques and ways of shoving their faces in front of it so that they can see. And that is, in a sense, the simple hope of this research program. Uh, and so after what Scott says, said earlier today, I just want to say that I stand here very humbly just showing you uh, a piece of research that uh, is at least uh, in terms of the number of people involved uh, is, is, is very different than what you may have seen. We've got data now from uh, close to five million test takers at a website uh, at which we measure people's biases and prejudices and so on. So I hope five million will suffice, Scott. Um, any knowledge or understanding of the illusion we may gain, Roger Shepard says, uh, remains virtually powerless to diminish the magnitude of the illusion. Okay? So knowing this, okay, I've just shown it to you, you know it, you even have it in your hands, but when it pops back up again, uh, this is something that we have to be aware of, that certain aspects of the world are going to be so challenging. Okay? Here's, yeah, so, so many of you are kind of going into yoga poses to do this, and yes, uh, that, will, that will help, but, but not really. Um, and, and so the point that I want to make is, with, with this is that, yeah, the, the, for people like me who are not interested in visual perception of objects, I've often used this to motivate a discussion about social perception, because like discussions of religion, uh, when you tell somebody that they have a bug in their head, um, they're going to deny it, and reasonably so. There's nothing that tells them that they're wrong. When you look at these two, you know. When you look at it, you know, you know they're not the same. Okay? But when you go home today and somebody in your family says to you, look, Dad, look, Mom, you know, here are you know, two tables and they're the same, your answer is going to be yes, they are. They may not look the same to you, but your mind has been changed. And this is, again, I would say if there is uh, a hope I hold for why it is that science can teach in a certain way that's compelling, it is about things like this. That once we know, even though the world may not appear that way, that we will know and we will say the right thing um, at the end of 